Hello and welcome to our channel. You want to become rich? Do you want to retire early? If yes, then you are in the right place. Today we are discussing about the book that changed the way you think about how venture capital industries play role in enhancing economic growth. But, before we start this video, if you are new to this channel, please take a moment to press on subscribe button and turn on the notification so you don't miss any amazing upcoming audiobook. If you find this content helpful, then don't forget to hit the like button and share to your friends and family who might get benefit from this information. An Introduction to Venture Capital Investing Who are the 99% and why are they so angry? In September of 2012, I saw a headline on the inner pages of my Wall Street Journal, Occupy Movement Turns One Year Old. Its effect still hard to define. Under the headline were details of arrests for disorderly conduct and photos of what looked like the aftermath of a tornado. Clues to the protesters' incongruent discontent were scattered through the crowd on professionally printed signs and hand-painted placards in fractured disarray. The crisis is capitalism. IPO is I am pissed off. Where is the change we voted for? I am so angry, I made a sign. The obvious disconnect was that the protesters were actually beneficiaries of the successful ventures of the 1% they so willingly maligned. The entire Occupy protest was conceived, coordinated, and thoroughly documented on various forms of social media, from Tumblr to Skype to Facebook to Twitter. The protests were photographed on Apple iPhones and Android phone cameras. The protesters kept up their energy by chugging Red Bull and eating Luna bars. They filled Zuccotti Park with nylon pop-up tents from Ozark Trail, slept in North Face sleeping bags, kept warm with Coleman heaters while sipping Starbucks lattes. Some signs were hand-painted, but many were printed professionally at Fast Signs or FedEx office. FedEx also delivered the Guy Fox masks and tricorner hats that were ordered from eBay. Donations to feed and support the long-term, committed, protesters were raised through Kickstarter. Corporate logos adorned hoodies, shirts, shoes, and denim jeans everywhere. No matter how socially aware and progressive the 99%ers fancied themselves, this disgruntled and unfocused multitude seemed blissfully ignorant of the fact that if it wasn't for capitalism, none of the resources they had relied on to fuel their righteous indignation would even exist. This global exercise of political democracy was only made possible by the economic democracy afforded by the brand of capitalism which has been practiced in America since the latter half of the 20th century. As American philosopher and educator Mortimer Adler wrote in the preface of the Capitalist Manifesto, which he co-wrote with Louis Kelso, democracy requires an economic system which supports the political ideas of liberty and equality for all. Men cannot exercise freedom in the political sphere when they are deprived of it in the economic system. In other words, the Occupy protesters were right to be angry at the excesses and abuses of the elitist few, but their anger and frustration had been hijacked by those with a subversive political agenda against the only economic system that has actually improved the lives of all mankind. Fraud, deceit, and corruption in both the financial system and in the government regulatory sector are the true culprits. The crony capitalists definitely need to be brought to justice in order to restore the integrity of the real free market system, however, history has proven conclusively that socialism, communism, and anarchy are not the remedy for the excesses of criminals and evildoers. The irony of the entire Occupy movement is that it was made possible by the very thing it decried, capitalism, and venture capitalists, VCs, in particular. Each of the companies represented by the countless logos and slogans that pervaded the Occupy protests and their multiple locales benefited, early in its conception, from an infusion of capital made by private investors who saw enormous potential and bore personal financial risk to fund the particular technology,
product or service that enabled the movement's effectiveness and the protester's comfort. The return on that investment came about through persistent work, the maximization of available resources, the public's perception of a fair exchange of value, and yes a lot of luck. It is the true manifestation of the American dream. Capitalism, especially in the free market paradigm, is not the zero-sum game the Occupy evangelists would have you believe. Every time people take a risk with their own money and end up winning, their good fortune does not mean that someone else lost. That is a ludicrous proposition believed only by the ill-informed or the leftist ideologue. That is the big lie told to fuel the envy and bigotry of the ignorant in order to promote a political and economic agenda. There is a much larger percentage of Americans who have achieved financial success than 1% of the population. Neither is 99% of the population shut out of opportunities that are still afforded to those who live in this greatest of nations. That is a propagandist distortion of statistics to the grossest extreme for purely nefarious reasons. The political paradigm put forth by the insiders behind the Occupy movement calls for sublimating the individual for the good of the collective, surrendering the inherent greed of private property rights for the altruistic enrichment of the community, and achieving a fair and equitable outcome for society by redistributing the ill-gotten gains of the successful in order to supplement the lifestyle choices of the underachievers. Really? The demonization of the economically successful is not at all about fairness and equality. It's about political power and economic control, the seizure of political power by those who cannot possibly gain it through reasoned public discourse and the theft of wealth that they desire but are unwilling to obtain through traditional, legitimate means. It is not fair. It is not democratic. It is unethical and it is totally antithetical to what it means to be an American. America was built on the premise that if you have a dream, set your goals, and work hard to achieve it, you can accomplish anything. How did we become the global vortex for demonizing success? How does transforming our commercial and financial centers into landfills of consumer excess serve to bring about constructive resolution of the gulf between the have-lots and the have-nots? Whining pithy slogans based upon entitlement expectations and offering no comprehensive solutions are not synonymous with civil disobedience. We must confront the fact that the American people have allowed a few sociopathic narcissists to steal their dreams along with their money. And we must refuse to accept the hysterical, illogical, and unfounded rhetoric that it is, unfair, and evil, for an individual to use her own vision, analysis, courage, and due diligence and to invest her own money to underwrite someone else's dream of starting a private business, creating jobs and contributing to the economic health and social well-being of the community. What is Venture Capital Investing? Venture capital investing is a lot like the old baseball adage, you win some, you lose some, and some get rained out. There is no secret formula or guaranteed path to success, especially in the field of venture capital investing. Many venture capitalists have lost their entire investment when the once brilliant ideas they funded foundered in the competitive marketplace or got torpedoed by even greater innovations. South and Hill Road, the legendary 3.5-mile stretch of concrete that runs east from I-280 to El Camino Real in Menlo Park, California, is the financial epicenter of Silicon Valley. It is littered with the fading memories of companies and grand ideas you VE never even heard of. It is also home to many early investors and businesses who went on to become household names, calculated risks made many of them quite comfortable. The returns on the initial investment are just the tangible rewards for being a venture capitalist. Many who live and work along this short stretch of road, which skirts the north side of Stanford University, are driven by more than money. Reed Hoffman is a perfect example. The 45-year-old partner at Greylock Partners has been in on the initiation of over 80 startups including such game-changers as PayPal and LinkedIn. 
He sits on the board of directors for KIVA.org and is known as the consummate connector in Silicon Valley. He genuinely cares about people and making the world a better place. As LinkedIn CEO Jeff Weiner says of Hoffman, his true north is making a positive, lasting impact on the world in a very profound way. Hoffman is a self-identified liberal who still drives the 2002 Acura he purchased with his share of the PayPal buyout. He probably understands the angst underscoring the Occupy complaint, but it would be an incredible stretch of credibility to paint Reed Hoffman with the Scarlet 1% label. How does one become a venture capitalist? For many, like Bill Joy, it was a natural progression. Born in 1954, Bill grew up in the northern Detroit suburb of Farmington Hills, Michigan. He obtained a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Michigan and by 1979 had completed a master's degree in computer science from the University of California, Berkeley. He also holds an honorary Ph.D. in engineering from the University of Michigan. As a graduate student at Berkeley, Joy designed and wrote Berkeley Unix, the first open-source operating system with built-in transmission control protocols for the Internet Protocol, tcp ip which is the basic communication backbone of the Internet. He founded Sun Microsystems in 1982 and was a key designer involved with a number of Sun technologies, including the Solaris operating system the Spark microprocessor architecture and several of its implementations, and the Java programming language. As an inventor, Bill is named on more than 40 patents. In February 1999, his many industry contributions were recognized in a Fortune magazine cover story that called him the Edison of the Internet. His accomplishments, the product of his keen intellect and inquisitive nature, resulted in substantial financial rewards. This prompted him to pursue interests in other areas, and in 2005 Bill Joy joined Kleiner Perkins Caulfield & Byers, one of the first Sandhill Road VC firms and a company that had provided the startup capital for Sun in 1982. Joy helped develop KPCB best strategy of funding game-changing technologies that broadly address the twin problems of climate change and sustainability. His ventures included investments in wind, solar, and thermoelectric power generation, low-cost electrical energy storage, renewable fuels and green chemicals from non-fuel sources, low-embodied energy materials, and energy-efficient electronics. He now serves as a partner emeritus at the firm. My VC journey is different from Bill Joy S. and Reed Hoffman S., but I believe we share some traits in common, a strong work ethic, a willingness to invest, the strong desire to make the world a better place, and an innate ability to take a setback as a learning experience and press onward. I was 16 years old when I experienced my first business failure. It was a summertime sole proprietorship called Paul Bunyan Tree Service. Due to my lack of experience in risk assessment and due diligence, I lost all my hard-earned gains paying for damages caused by a tree coming through a client's roof. It was an expensive lesson, but business fascinated me, and I was determined to learn from my mistakes. I earned a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Redlands and went on to receive an MBA from the Southern Methodist University Graduate School of Business and a master's degree in international business from the American Graduate School. After finishing my university studies, I was hired by the Bank of California, where I monitored privately held companies and subsequently worked with a pioneering emerging markets investment manager. London-based GT Capital Management. I then self-financed a startup called TCG, a telecom consulting engineering practice, which I sold to PricewaterhouseCoopers Consulting Practice. This helped set the course of my life, and later I landed a job as head of venture capital investments with Wells Fargo Bank, where I serendipitously developed one of the first U.S. funds with Anthony Moore, one of my current partners at Gherkin Capital Associates, GCA. 
Some of the best ideas are born by complete accident. Sometimes the best path is the one you take alone. For example, while with Wells Fargo, I had been presented with opportunities to invest in a number of risky, early-stage companies, including Sun Microsystems and Microsoft. My investment acumen aside, the organizational guidelines that governed investments of the group at that time would not even permit me to present these opportunities to the Group's Investment Committee. The unintended consequence was the creation of one of the first U.S. venture capital fund of funds. I did a stint at Montgomery Securities Venture Capital and was subsequently hired to become a co-GP with Protec, the venture capital investment subsidiary of Prudential Securities, founded by another one of my current GCA partners, Hugh McClung. As one of the largest U.S. venture capital funds, Protec was responsible for completing 50 IT and biotech sector early stage and expansion stage investments and was one of the first VC funds to pioneer corporate partnering as a co-investment strategy. Eventually, I was asked to head up Prudential Securities Technology Investment Banking Division. I left Prudential in the late 1980s, thinking I was ready for an early retirement. After a much-needed vacation in South Africa, one of my favorite destinations, the entrepreneurial bug bit once again. I founded GCA in 1989 as an alternative asset fund management firm, with particular focus on alternative assets and emerging markets. Version 1.0 of our business was to act as a cedar to next-generation alternative asset fund managers, backing more than two dozen teams. GCA morphed circa 2000 into its present V2.0 business, managing and advising alternative assets, private equity, venture capital, and hedge funds, and merger and acquisitions advising. I think what differentiates our approach toward investing is that we take a very active and hands-on approach toward managing assets and, as a privately owned boutique, have the flexibility to move on investment opportunities very quickly. We are not reluctant to do the heavy lifting associated with being the lead investor. We are chameleons by nature and have adapted our investment thesis and approach to the prevailing investment climates. By way of example, our latest vintage VC funds investment strategy is to focus on startup and or early stage companies and deal fatigued expansion stage companies, where our value add is more advantageous than our investment capital. An overview of the venture capital industry. Like Bill Joy, most venture capitalists come into the industry from another field in which they have experienced success or which holds a great deal of interest for them. There is a high-tech legend that Bill Joy and futurist Ray Kurzweil were having drinks in a hotel bar one night and got into a rather protracted discussion about GNR technologies, genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics, and the possibilities of reaching a point in the future where the human race becomes one with machine. This is a favorite and recurring theme in Kurzweil's writings, but it so disturbed Joy that he developed a fund to invest in GNR for the sole reason of monitoring the progress of the sector's development. Reid Hoffman started Socialnet.com as a way for students on the Stanford campus to connect with others who shared their interests. He was about seven years ahead of the social media phenomenon, but the interest has definitely influenced his investment strategies. It led to him doing everything right when he rolled out LinkedIn several years later. VCs Don T typically use a lot of their own money. That is usually an activity reserved for what is known as an angel investor and typically involves investments of $1 million or less. Venture capitalists form a firm and start a fund, which is often designated for a specific industry sector. The fund will attract money from pension funds, endowments, foundations, and high net worth individuals, HNWs, and family offices who are interested in either investing in that particular sector or just looking for the higher than normal return that is the attraction and the pitfall of venture capital investing. 
When all goes as planned, the VC finds an entrepreneur with the next big idea, invests the fund's money for an equity position, mentors the entrepreneur's management team to the point where the new company is showing success, and then exits the investment through either an initial public offering (IPO) on the stock market or a sale of the company through a merger and acquisition by another firm. The return on the growth of the VC's equity position is then returned to the fund and paid out to the fund's investors on a prorated basis. According to statistics of the National Venture Capital Association, NVCA, 40% of all ventures fail to ever show a positive return, while another 40% may eventually break even. Everybody is chasing that elusive 20% that is the next LinkedIn, Google, or Facebook. Those success stories are what keep the lights on in the office buildings along Sand Hill Road and elsewhere across the country. Venture capital activity has a significant impact on the U.S. and global economies. Venture capital is a catalyst for job creation, innovation, technology advancement, international competitiveness, and increased tax revenues. According to the 2011 Venture Impact Study, Produced by IHS Global Insight, originally venture-backed companies accounted for 11.87 million jobs and over $3.1 trillion in revenue in the United States, based on 2010 data. Those totals compare to 21% of GDP and 11% of private sector employment. So, how is the VC industry doing these days? For the fourth quarter of 2012, the NVCA issued a press release with the headline, Venture-backed exits enjoyed higher average values on lower total volumes in 2012. According to the release, $1.4 billion was raised from eight IPOs during the fourth quarter of 2012. This was a decline in volume from the preceding quarter, but a 23% increase in dollars raised. For the full year, 2012 saw 49 IPOs raise a total of $21.5 billion, driven largely by the Facebook offering. This was the strongest annual period for IPOs, by dollar value, since 2000. M&A deals were down 11% from 2011, with 120 disclosed value deals returning $21.5 billion for full year 2012. As detailed in other little books, indexing and thoughtful asset allocation are probably a solid choice for many investors' core holdings. But for those seeking exceptional gains on a long-term investment horizon, alternative investments like private equity, including venture capital, can offer an uncorrelated, and often highly lucrative, complement to an otherwise staid investment plan. Just like other markets, venture capital experiences periodic investment cycles. Coming off the historic dot-com boom and the Great Recession that followed, venture capital has recently taken some hits but is poised for a new run. The lesson of the late 1990s is that venture capital can be powerful at times, said Greg Turk, director of investments for the $37 billion teachers' retirement system of the state of Illinois. The system is increasing its allocation to venture capital to diversify its portfolio. If you don't have it, you might miss out if venture capital returns outperform again. Not your grandfather's venture capital. Hold on a second, you say. Building tangible economic value sounds great, but aren't private equity and venture capital investments only available to highly sophisticated, ultra-wealthy individuals or institutional investors? The answer is yes and no. Historically, your grandfather's venture capital tended to be a closed club to which average investors felt they could not apply. But market competition is causing venture capital to evolve in exciting new ways, which I LL tell you about in the chapters to come. What this little book is and what it isn't. The book is not intended as a textbook on how to raise VC or as a guide to becoming the next Google. 
I provide an insider's view of how VC works and how to best define VC, tying its fascinating history to its transcendent present. I offer additional background into who VC investors are, what their investment strategies are, their VC performance, and the sectors they invested in, as well as the difference geography can make. We explore the multiplier impact of VC investing, both in dollar terms and social impact. We examine the prevailing investment climate, revealing startling data on new startup growth and challenges. Then we take a look at both the private and listed venture capital investment options available to you so that you too have the ability to become a one percenter. This little book outlines a practical field guide to the VC investment process, everything from setting investment criteria to monetizing VC investments. You will find a handy appendix with a glossary of terms and links to a due diligence checklist and additional resources pertinent to VC investing. With this information you can properly assess the risk-reward relationship of venture capital investing. I believe you will find the insights offered pleasantly surprising. Chapter 1. Historic Overview of Venture Capitalism Why is an historical overview of VC important? Because history does in fact repeat itself, and a study of history allows us to frame an understanding of the present and the future. The players and the investment climate change, but the entrepreneur's innate instinct to risk capital for a return is no different today from what it was when John D. Rockefeller became America's first billionaire in 1900. When Andrew Carnegie joined forces with his childhood friend, Henry Phipps, to form Carnegie Steel in 1892, they were driven by the same conviction to improve the status quo as are the idealistic dream chasers of the 21st century. It was these early trailblazers who paved the way and developed the techniques that have laid the foundation for VC as we know it today. Arguably, historians will debate the nature of history and its usefulness. This includes using the discipline as a way of providing perspective on the problems and opportunities of the present. I believe it to be an important tool in providing a systematic account and window to the future. It is patently dishonest and irresponsible to perpetuate the popular mythology that those who created great wealth in America are to be despised and that there are no useful lessons to be learned from an objective, historical review of their contributions to the subject at hand. As John F. Kennedy said, to state the facts frankly is not to despair the future nor indict the past. The prudent heir takes careful inventory of his legacies and gives a faithful accounting to those whom he owes an obligation of trust. In the beginning. On Sunday, May 23, 1937, John Davison Rockefeller, Sr., died just 46 days short of his 98th birthday. He left behind what is arguably the single greatest fortune ever amassed by a single businessman. He began accumulating his wealth on September 26, 1855, when he became the 16-year-old assistant bookkeeper at Hewitt and Tuttle, a commission merchant and produce shipper in Cleveland, Ohio. Three years later, he left Hewitt and formed his own commission merchant house with his friend Maurice B. Clark, using money he had saved from his $25 monthly salary and $1,000 borrowed from his father at 10% interest. It was during this initial period of managing a business, struggling week to week to make weekly payroll, that he discovered his innate abilities to quickly seize an opportunity, evaluate the risk-reward, and negotiate a path forward. By December 1862, Clark and Rockefeller was a going concern, making more than $17,000 annually in occupying four contiguous warehouses on River Street. That same year, the partners invested $4,000 of company profits with a chemist named Samuel Andrews. Andrews had developed a cost-effective method for distilling kerosene from crude oil. The partners built the Excelsior Oil Works and commercialized this process, providing a cheap and efficient means of lighting to the masses. 
Rockefeller was able to buy out Clark in 1865 by borrowing funds based solely upon his business reputation. He went full-time into the oil business, building another refinery called the Standard Works. On January 10, 1870, the partnership with Andrews was dissolved and replaced by a joint stock Phi RM named Standard Oil Company, Ohio. Sales of stock generated $1 million in capital and Standard Oil controlled 10% of the nation's petroleum refining business. This business model served for many years as a fairly standard template for how businesses or ventures were formed and financed or capitalized. Business founders would use their own money and whatever money they could borrow from family, friends, and anyone else who would listen to their ideas for a new or improved business. The people who invested the early money usually did so based upon the founder, ability to sell them on the capability of the idea to solve a problem or provide a much-needed service for which the public would clamor. This became known as seed capital and was usually less than $1 million. It was risky at best and often required early investors to wait until the enterprise was a profitable, going concern before they could realize a return on their investments. If a founder came up with a very good idea, he could sometimes gain financing from an angel investor. These were often wealthy individuals who would invest their own money into the enterprise in exchange for either some form of convertible debt, such as a 10-year bond which could be converted into stock or cash upon maturity, or in the form of a percentage of ownership of the new company or equity. As all wealthy people quickly discover, the image of Scrooge McDuck romping and rolling around in his private vault on piles of gold coins and bags of currency is only true in the make-believe world of comic books. Wealth will be depleted over time if not put to work. Taxes, inflation, expenses, and frivolous spending have caused more than a few lottery winners to end up in financial straits within a very few years. Enough stories abound about spoiled, entitled trust fund beneficiaries who completely squander their inheritances that there is an ageless proverb that says, they're best but three generations from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves. Money must be put to work by being invested, either in expanding one foot's own business or in someone else's venture. The Roots of Venture Capital Carnegie Steel Company was sold to the United States Steel Corporation in 1901 for $480 million, of which about half went to founder Andrew Carnegie. The second largest shareholder was Carnegie's partner, Henry Phipps. In 1907, Phipps formed Bessemer Trust as a private family office to manage his fortune. Four years later, he transferred $4 million in stocks and bonds to each of his five children and Bessemer Venture Partners was launched. It is regarded as the nation's first venture capital firm. According to the company's website, www.bvp.com, they currently manage more than $4 billion of venture capital invested in over 130 companies around the world. Lawrence Rockefeller inherited his grandfather's seat on the New York Stock Exchange in 1937 and wasted no time investing his inheritance in his passion, aviation. In 1938, he provided $3.5 million for Eddie Rickenbacker to purchase Eastern Airlines and invested in the McDonnell Aircraft Corporation. The Rockefeller Brothers Fund was founded in 1940 as a philanthropic foundation to allow Lawrence and his siblings a vehicle through which to provide grants that promoted the noble ideals of democratic practice, sustainable development, and peace and security around the world. Lawrence supported the fund, but saw an opportunity to provide an investment vehicle for his siblings and other wealthy individuals. In 1946, he founded Rockefeller Brothers Fund Incorporated as a limited partner investment firm. The firm was one of the first to establish the practice of pooling capital in a professionally managed fund. In 1969, the company changed its name to Venrock Associates. 
Venrock has been one of the most successful venture capital funds and has provided early funding for startups of such Silicon Valley giants as Intel and Apple Computer. While Venrock's primary focus could be said to be firms involved with medical technology, they have spread their investments across biofuels, vehicle technology, mobile-slash-social-slash-digital media, software-as-a-service, SaaS, and enterprise, and security. The post-World War II years saw rapid growth in this new style of development capital investing. John Hay, Jock, Whitney, another scion of 19th-century American wealth, spent the 1930s and the early 1940s living the archetypical high society, polo-playing playboy lifestyle, investing his $100 million trust fund in the fledgling motion picture industry. In late 1945, Jock Whitney had an epiphany. He enlisted a fraternity brother named Benno Schmidt, a tall Texan with working-class roots, to be his business partner. J. H. Whitney and Company, JHW, was founded in 1946 to finance entrepreneurs who were returning from the war with great ideas, but whose business plans were less than welcome at traditional banks. Schmidt is often credited with coining the term venture capital as a replacement for development capital, although there are earlier uses of the phrase. One of Whitney's earliest and most famous investments was in the Florida Foods Corporation, later known as Minute Made Orange Juice. Today, JHW remains privately owned by its investing professionals, and its main activity is to provide private equity capital to small and middle market companies with strong growth prospects in a number of industries including consumer, healthcare, specialty manufacturing, and business services. The First VCs The influence of Jock Whitney in the world of venture capital doesn't end with JHW and Minute Maid. In 1957, he recruited David Morgenthaler to serve as president and CEO of Fozico Incorporated, a manufacturer of industrial chemicals in the J.H. Whitney and Company investment portfolio. Morgenthaler made the company a multinational success before stepping down in 1968 to go into venture capital himself. He founded Morgenthaler Ventures in Cleveland and Menlo Park. Forty-three years later, the firm is still going strong. Morgenthaler Ventures has worked with over 300 young companies, including dozens of biomedical startups. Morgenthaler also served as a founding director of the National Venture Capital Association, NVCA, from 1977 to 1979. The year 1946 also saw the launch of the American Research and Development Corporation. ARDC was the brainchild of George Doriot, a business professor at Harvard before the start of World War II. Upon enlistment, he was given the rank of Brigadier General in the U.S. Army and served as Deputy Director of Research at the War Department. Working in concert with U.S. Senator Ralph Flanders of Vermont and MIT President Carl Compton Doriot developed financial vehicles that allowed private sector participation in the war effort through investments in the manufacture of weapons, equipment, and supplies. After the war, Doriot continued his partnership with Flanders and Compton in ARDC. It is often called the first actual venture capital firm because it was the first to raise funds from institutional investors, $1.8 million raised from nine institutions, including MIT, the University of Pennsylvania, and the Rice Institute. ARDC also became the first private equity firm to operate as a publicly traded closed-end fund when it collected $1.7 million in a 1966 public offering. These innovations earned Doriot the moniker of the father of venture capital. D. Doriot's best move, however, was his 1957 decision to invest $70,000 with MIT engineers Kenneth Olson and Harlan Anderson to start the Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC. Following DEC's IPO in 1968, the value of ARDC's stake had grown to $355 million. 
The success gave an early boost to high-tech development along Boston, S. Route 128 and demonstrated the viability of the venture capital investment model. And, just like at J.H. Whitney and Company, ARDC employees went on to make their own mark in the world of venture capital. Bill Elfers had been the number two employee at American Research and Development. When he left ARDC in 1965 to form Greylock and Company, he decided not to follow the restrictive public funding model. Instead, he operated as a limited partnership, now the typical structure for venture firms, and raised $10 million from six limited partners. A second fund followed in 1973, and last November, what's now called Greylock Partners announced it had closed the $575 million Greylock 13 fund. Shockley chooses silicon. The entire VC industry has evolved from these kinds of fraternal, sometimes internecine relationships of people being brought in to work at a firm and then deciding that they would be happier on their own. There is no better illustration of this than the story of the traitorous eight. William Bradford Shockley Jr., February 13, 1910 to August 12, 1989, was an American physicist who co-invented the transistor along with John Bardeen and Walter Hauser Bratton. All three were awarded the 1956 Nobel Prize in Physics. Shockley grew up in Palo Alto and did his undergraduate studies at the California Institute of Technology, Caltech. He moved to Boston to complete his Ph.D. at MIT and immediately started working at Bell Labs upon graduation in 1936. Despite his brilliance, Shockley was said to be not terribly socially adept and didn't understand what motivated people very well. An example of this is the story that he left Bell Labs because the company listed Bardeen, Bratton, and Shockley in alphabetical order on the transistor S patent he felt his name should have been listed first because of the importance of his contribution. Whatever the reason, he returned to Caltech in 1953 as a visiting professor. Shockley had become convinced that the natural characteristics of silicon meant it would eventually replace germanium as the primary material for transistor construction. Texas Instruments had started production of silicon transistors in 1954, and Shockley thought he could improve upon their developments. Arnold Orville Beckman, founder of Beckman Instruments and one of Shockley's few friends, agreed to back Shockley's research in this area as a division of his company in Pasadena, California. Shockley's mother was in declining health at the time, and he wanted to be closer to her home in Palo Alto, so a compromise was worked out. In the summer of 1956, the Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory Division of Beckman Instruments opened operations in a small building located at 391 San Antonio Road in Mountain View, California. S. Hockley tried to hire some of his former workers from Bell Labs, but none of them wanted to leave the high-tech research corridor that was developing along Route 128 around Boston. Instead, he assembled a team of young scientists and engineers from the West Coast. They began researching a new method for producing a cylindrical arrangement of single crystal silicon. The Traitorous Eight In October 1957, eight of these young and equally talented engineers reached the end of their ability to tolerate Dr. Shockley's management style. They quit the Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory and formed Fairchild Semiconductor in Mountain View. Legend says it was Shockley who branded them as the Traitorous Eight, but it was really a moniker that was applied by a newspaper reporter several years later. Fortunately, the group was helped and guided by a young financier named Arthur Rock. Rock was a forward looking investment banker at the prestigious New York investment firm of Hayden. Stone. Rock believed technology was the future for investment and happened to know Sherman Fairchild of Fairchild Camera and Instrument, FCI, in New York. Fairchild was looking for technology companies in which to invest, and the timing was perfect. Sherman Fairchild's father, George, 
was one of the original partners in the formation of the Computing Tabulating Recording Company. The company was later renamed IBM with Tom Watson as president. George Fairchild was that company's first chairman, and he and Watson owned an equal number of shares in the company. Fairchild died in 1924 with his son Sherman as the sole heir. When Watson died in 1956, his estate was divided between his wife and their four children. This left Sherman Fairchild as the biggest single owner of IBM stock. He sold some of it, which was the source of funding for the Fairchild Semiconductor startup. An interesting bit of trivia is that Fairchild Semiconductor was started with a $1.5 million investment by Fairchild Camera and Instrument. In return, FCI received an option to buy all of the stock that the eight held plus the stock held by Hayden, Stone for $3 million. The stock was divided by Arthur Rock so that each one of the eight got 10% of the stock and Hayden, Stone got the balance of 20% for putting the deal together. This is believed to be where the 80-20 model used in venture capital LP slash GP deal structuring today originated. It was also the first venture-funded startup company in the Bay Area. The company made transistors out of silicon instead of the traditional germanium and established their facility in the Santa Clara Valley. That led to the name Silicon Valley being coined in the 1970s for all of the technology companies that were spun off of or related to Fairchild in that area. The traitorous eight were Julius Blank, Victor Henry Grinick, Jean Amity Horney, Eugene Kleiner, J.T. Last, Gordon Earl Moore, Robert Norton Noyce, and C. Sheldon Roberts. Julius Blank, June 2, 1925 to September 17, 2011, set up the machine shop and the initial assembly area at Fairchild. He was also responsible for establishing the subsequent offshore manufacturing facility in Hong Kong as sales soon outpaced the young Phi RM's domestic capabilities. This was the precursor to the advent of offshore or outsourced manufacturing pioneered by VC tech companies. Blank also led the establishment of an entrepreneurial business model, which was to become the template for technology firms for the rest of the 20th century, stock options, no job titles, and open working relationships. He left Fairchild in 1969 to become a consultant and co-founded Zycor in 1978. Zycor was subsequently acquired by Intersil Corporation in 2004 for approximately $529 million. Victor Henry Grinick, November 26, 1924 to November 4, 2000 left Fairchild in 1968 to study computer science while teaching electrical engineering at UC Berkeley. He later taught at Stanford University as well. In 1975, he published the seminal textbook, Introduction to Integrated Circuits. In 1978, he was appointed CEO of Identronix, the company that pioneered radio frequency identification, RFID, systems, used extensively in anti-theft tags. In 1985, Grinick founded and became CEO of Escort Memory Systems to commercialize RFID tags for industrial applications. EMS was acquired by Datalogic four years later. In 1993, he co-founded Arco's Design, a manufacturer of emulators, which was acquired by Synopsys in 1995 for $9.3 million. Jean Amadi Horney, September 26, 1924 to January 12, 1997, was a silicon transistor pioneer remembered for developing the planar process for manufacturing semiconductor devices such as transistors. Along with J. Last and Sheldon Roberts, Horney founded Amelco, which became Teledyne in 1961 in another Arthur Rock-funded acquisition. In 1964, he founded Union Carbide Electronics, and in 1967, he founded Intersil. Eugene Jean Kleiner, 
May 12, 1923 to November 20, 2003, was an Austrian-born American engineer and venture capitalist. In 1956, he was among the first to accept an offer from William Shockley to come to California to help form what became Shockley Semiconductor Laboratory. According to Arthur Rock, Kleiner led the eight who formed Fairchild Semiconductor. Kleiner later invested his own money in Intel, a semiconductor firm founded in 1968 by fellow Fairchild founders Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore. In 1972 Kleiner joined Hewlett-Packard veteran Tom Perkins to found Kleiner Perkins, the venture capital firm now headquartered on Sand Hill Road. In 1978, the company added Brooke Byers and Frank J. Coffey ELD as named partners. In full disclosure, Frank Coffey ELD is a GCA shareholder, a close friend, and godfather to my daughter. Kleiner Perkins was an early investor in more than 300 information technology and biotech firms, including Amazon. Com, AOL, Electronic Arts, Flextronics, Genentech, Google, Hypertech, Intuit, Lotus Development, LSI Logic, Macromedia, Netscape, Quantum, Sun Microsystems, Verifone, and Tandem which Wells Fargo Ventures had the good fortune to be a co-investor in. He retired from day-to-day -day responsibilities in the early 1980s. Gene Kleiner is remembered for some of his notable observations about the venture capital industry. Although reserved, he often would make a statement that so adroitly summed up a situation that they became known as Kleiner's Laws. Some of his more notable quotes are, there is a time when panic is the appropriate response. The problem with most companies is they don't know what business they're in. Invest in people, not just products. Risk up front, out early. The last one is considered the most strategically serious of Kleiner's laws. J.T. Last, born October 18, 1929, is a physicist. He left Fairchild Semiconductor in 1961 as head of integrated circuit development. He then co-founded Amelco Corporation with Gene Horney and Sheldon Roberts, and served as director of research and development. In 1966, Amelco was acquired by Teledyne Technologies, where Last was vice president of research and development for eight years. In 1989, he founded the Archaeological Conservancy, which has preserved and protected over 150 archaeological sites in 28 U.S. states. From 1982 to 2010, he was president of California-based Hillcrest Press, which publishes fine art books on the history of American painting. Last has authored or co-authored a number of art books. It was Jay Last who best summed up why it is almost always more than a single great idea that leads to a successful enterprise. In an interview by Craig Addison of Semi on September 15, 2007, Last pointed out how groundbreaking innovations are usually the result of the past efforts of many unsung researchers. So much is based on past inventions and looking at what is practical to make rather than the key technical thing. When Bo Lojek wrote his book, History of Semiconductor Engineering, I was asked to write a little testimonial on the back and this was a quotation that I had written for Bo for his book. You and I agree that while the world loves a hero, semiconductor progress depended on the efforts and ideas of a large number of people and that moving forward depended on contributions going back a few decades in some cases. Also, as is the case with most inventions, a number of people with access to the same pool of common knowledge were working independently at the same time to put it all together and to make the necessary extensions to the existing technology and who realized that the time was right for society to accept the new concepts. That says that nearly all technical progress is a group effort and always has been, and that was certainly true at Fairchild, and there were a lot of unsung heroes involved in all of these things. With all of these things it wasn't, as I said earlier, an enormous leap forward in imagination.
you sit down for a few minutes and you could visualize these things. The key question was what can we make? Every day we could come up with a dozen new great ideas of things we could do but the question was, one, could we make them? And, two, would the world buy them? So we were focused a lot more than a lot of the venture capital firms are today that think the world is going to pay them for being bright and having a bright idea. We learned quickly in those days that the world doesn't work that way. See, Sheldon Roberts, born 1926, is a semiconductor pioneer. At Fairchild, Roberts was responsible for silicon crystal production. He later joined Gene Horney and Jay Last to found Amelco. The last two members of the traitorous eight have unquestionably left their mark on the history of the human race. Dr. Gordon E. Moore, born January 3, 1929, is an American businessman who is known as the chairman of Silicon Valley. He is also the author of Moore's Best Law, his 1965 observation that the number of transistors on integrated circuit boards, and thus, computing power, doubled every two years. His business partner, Robert Norton Noyce, December 12, 1927 to June 3, 1990, was nicknamed the mayor of Silicon Valley. In July 1968, these two men left Fairchild and co-founded NM Electronics with funding again provided under the auspices of Arthur Rock, who had joined Tommy Davis in 1961 to form Davis and Rock LP. A year later, NM Electronics changed its name to Intel Corporation. Noyce is credited, along with Jack Kilby, with the invention of the integrated circuit or microchip, which fueled the personal computer revolution and gave Silicon Valley its name. The relaxed culture that Noyce brought to Intel was a carryover from his style at Fairchild Semiconductor. He treated employees as family, rewarding and encouraging teamwork. His follow your bliss management style set the tone for many Silicon Valley success stories. Why was the venture capital method of investing chosen? Capital for venture capital funds comes from a variety of sources. The economic boom that followed World War II saw developmental funding shift from the traditional purview of wealthy individuals and their family funds to more accessible venture capital and private equity firms. By establishing a fund that is aimed at a particular sector, Venture capital firms provide a vehicle whereby qualified and institutional investors could put their money into enterprises that best represent their aims and goals. By providing experienced management with respect to the establishment of specific funding criteria, diligently screening funding candidates, and the imposition of a professional management overlay, investors were assured that their money wasn't being wasted or squandered. More importantly, Clear exit strategies were developed, and new ventures were guided toward liquidity events such as an initial public offering, IPO, or sale of the company through a merger with another firm or acquisition by a firm in a related field, M&A. The general partners, GPs, or the investment managers of the VC funds, at the early stage venture capital firm would aim for these liquidity events to occur within three to seven years after initial funding in order to allow the new enterprise to mature into a profitable business. Many firms have overlapping funds set up so that there is a continuous flow of diverse funding opportunities. In either case, the goal was for the VC fund to realize a return on investment, ROI, sufficient to allow the investor participants or limited partners, LPs, of the fund to, hopefully, realize a gain on their investment. The technology and innovations that came to market in the 1960s and 1970s saw an entirely different breed of successful inventor or researcher turned wealthy investor. In the 1980s, computing became personal, phones became cellular, and words like Apple, and Windows took on entirely new meanings. The 1990s brought us the World Wide Web, HTML, the Pentium processor, the Smart Pill, and Viagra. 
This past decade saw the ABOSOR artificial heart representing groundbreaking miniaturization of medical technology and an artificial liver invented by Dr. Kenneth Matsumura. The Braille glove, wearable nanotechnology, translucent concrete, and a plethora of social media platforms, applications, and computer peripherals have appeared. All of them have required someone to believe in them enough to risk putting their money where their heart is. Just when you thought you had seen it all, a new generation comes along and offers a fresh perspective or a radical new take on what we commonly refer to today as disruptive technology, another VC coin term. The world is reinvented and recreated on a constant and ongoing basis thanks to venture capital. VC investors are anything but greedy and unfeeling, quite the opposite. They are visionaries. They are the guarantors of the future. And as many as there are and as varied as their investments are, there is always room for one more person who has the ability to see dreams and the patience to help them come true. Past is Prologue We open this chapter by asserting that it is important to understand venture capital's long and storied past as a prerequisite for understanding today's climate and having insight into the future. I am hopeful that the historic anecdotes provided here give valuable insights that will help you appreciate that VC and its success are very much about people. There is no prescribed set of formulas adhering to an Austrian economics guidebook. There is no secret sauce. Time and time again, success has come down to one person getting to know the person across the table and developing the feeling that this was a person he could trust and someone he could invest in. And, as we have seen, history does often repeat itself, especially in the world of VC. Chapter 2 The VC Industry Today One Grand Slam home run does not make you a Hall of Fame baseball player. When searching for a VC role model or mentor, it is more important to remember that it is easy to become impressed with those one-hit wonders who, whether by good timing or good luck, have had a 100-plus X bagger or investment success. One big score is an historical event, but it is, in many cases, unrelated to the skill set required for long-term success in venture capital investing. That is an achievement marked by the repeatability of the successful exit in the prevailing and constantly changing investment climates. We should instead seek out the serial repeat players, those rare gems who are not just investing a fund's money, but who also infuse the deal with their own intellectual capital, experience, and hard work. We want to find those power players who seem to have developed a sixth sense about achieving success. Whether one is investing in a VC fund run by partners or making a direct investment run by a CEO, the key is not to be impressed with a single success or the power of their branding. The maxim, you are only as good as your last victory, is less applicable in the VC universe than, what have you done for me lately? Complicating this task, is that once the list of successful VC investors has been pared down to the serial winners, the list is further narrowed by the natural human tendency for the successful to enjoy the fruits of their labor and either retire or become much less active in the funds they manage or companies they run. Once a person has achieved true financial freedom, it is hard to ignore the allure of travel, leisure sports, creative arts, or philanthropy. Adventures in VC Investing Much has changed in the venture capital industry since those early days of Fairchild Semiconductor. Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore left Fairchild in 1968 to form Intel, and Eugene Kleiner invested in their new venture. Four years later, Kleiner would leave engineering for good and team with HP executive Tom Perkins to found Kleiner Perkins, one of the seminal venture capital firms on Sand Hill Road. These men were able to do this because Fairchild Semiconductor had been a wildly successful company and their 10% ownership stakes had made them wealthy men. Their technology changed the world of electronics, however, no matter how great or needed the product may be, Nothing happens until somebody sells something. 
In the case of Fairchild, that somebody was a non-engineer named Donald T. Valentine. He was a senior sales and marketing executive with Fairchild Semiconductor who happened to have connections with the military and convinced them to use Fairchild Semiconductors in their Minuteman missile program. Dion left Fairchild to go to National Semiconductor, but kept in touch with his former colleagues at Intel. In 1972, convinced that the path to future riches was in semiconductors, systems, and software, Don founded Sequoia Capital. He was one of the original investors in Apple Computer, AAPL, Atari, Cisco Systems, CSCO, LSI Logic, LSI, Oracle RCL, and Electronic Arts, ERTS. According to Don, success in today's venture capital world is reducible to a few words, dealing with change. You have to be interested in managing change, and you have to recognize that change is necessary. Today's solution is wrong for tomorrow. Technology changes rapidly, so you re able to see it very quickly. The evolution of handheld computers happened in three years, and you have unbelievably good products right now that were not conceivable four years ago. That's what I mean about embracing change. You have to recognize that what you have now is not the end, it's not the limit. When you can t do that change from the Walkman to the iPod, you become like General Motors. You cannot develop anything new. General Motors, in a very short period of time, lost their role to a Japanese company by the name of Toyota, who did embrace change. After having established the intellectual property, IP, while conducting our due diligence, one of the first questions we always ask our prospective portfolio companies is, what is the ongoing product development plan regarding future enhancements, such as version 2.0, version 3.0, and so on. Steve Blank is a consulting associate professor at Stanford University and a lecturer and serial entrepreneur. He has a blog that is widely read and has published several books on starting a successful enterprise. In a recent cover story for the Harvard Business Review, Blank discussed some of the changes taking place in the venture capital industry. Another important trend is the decentralization of access to financing. Venture capital used to be a tight club of formal firms clustered near Silicon Valley, Boston, and New York. In today's entrepreneurial ecosystem, new super angel funds, smaller than the traditional $100 million sized VC fund, can make early stage investments. Worldwide, hundreds of accelerators, like Y Combinator and Techstars, have begun to formalize seed investments. And crowdsourcing sites like Kickstarter provide another, more democratic method of financing startups. These angel, accelerator, and micro VC funds, including our own GCA Catalyst Fund, are able to make the less than $1 million seed, startup, or early stage investments that the larger institutional VC funds cannot make due to their sheer size. Recognizing how underserved the sector is, GCA Catalyst is also completing diligence on a crowdfunding entity to take advantage of the popularity of this funding method once the 2012 Jobs Act is fully enacted. How it all began Several major VC firms were started in the late 1960s to early 1970s period. Most were related to the rapid growth of technology being seen along the Route 128 corridor outside of Boston and Silicon Valley. Boston firms included Greylock Partners, founded in 1965, and Charles River Ventures, 1970. The Silicon Valley area south of San Francisco Bay spawned several firms in that period which are still active, many of them located on Sand Hill Road in Menlo Park. These include Sutter Hill Ventures, 1964, Morgenthaler Ventures, 1968, Mayfi ELD Fund, 1969, Kleiner Perkins Coffee ELD and Buyers, 1972, Sequoia Capital, 1972, and Sofanova Ventures, 
1974. Greylock Partners moved their headquarters to Menlo Park in 2010, but still have an office in the Boston area. Like every other business, venture capital investing is subject to the ebb and flow of economic conditions. We created our first fund of funds in the early 1980s. Across the industry, 650 VC firms vied for a portion of the $31 billion venture capital pool that had flowed into the industry. By the end of the decade, the number of players and the size of the pool had reduced significantly. The industry returned and peaked in the first quarter of 2000 with more than $28.40 billion invested across 2,160 deals. The latest statistics for Q1 of 2013 shows that 319 firms invested an average of just under $7 million across 863 transactions. The trend is coming back down with respect to the number of VC firms and the quantity and value of their investments. More than ever before, it is imperative that today, S venture capitalists stay abreast of what the competition is doing. For some VCs, it is a matter of trying to determine where the trend is heading. If several firms are jumping on solar panel developers, that may indicate that someone either has or is about to make a technological breakthrough. For the contrarian, it might indicate that it is time to look for an edge in clean coal technology or more efficient steam turbines. Either way, one of the best trend references is the Money Tree Report. The Money Tree Report The Money Tree Report is published on a quarterly basis by global business consultant PricewaterhouseCoopers in cooperation with the National Venture Capital Association. This report has become one of the basic VC reference sources for the financial community. Its purpose is to measure and report on venture capital investment activity across the United States, and it contains detailed quarterly results and aggregate trend data beginning with 1995 on up to the most recent quarter. The global business news organization Thomson Reuters compiles data on emerging companies that receive financing and the venture capital firms that provide it. This data are compiled and organized based upon several different criteria by Price Waterhouse Coopers, who produce and maintain the online report. Geographical Definitions For the most part, geography matters to VCs. They want to fund businesses located in ecosystems with the requisite VC infrastructure in place to easily access and enable success, whether it be a pool of talented engineers to recruit, serial entrepreneurs to tap into, board member talent, other VCs to co-invest with, or the abundance of support professional service providers such as IP law firms, legal and audit. Many quite frankly just prefer the flexibility to jump in the car and easily meet with their companies. The Money Tree Report divides the United States into 18 different regions. In the report for the first quarter of 2013, 863 deals were financed, with the average size of the financing package being about $6.8 million. The total invested in this period across the entire nation for this quarter was more than $5.8 billion. Of that total, nearly 38% went to fund 274 companies in the Silicon Valley region. This region is defined as Northern California, the San Francisco Bay Area, and the northern half of the California coastline. The New England region, which includes Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and parts of Connecticut, excluding Fairfield County, came in second for the quarter with $677 million funding 88 projects. With 98 projects sharing $576 million, the New York metro region, defined as the metropolitan New York area, northern New Jersey, and Fairfield County in Connecticut, came in third with 9.83%. Texas had only 31 projects, but the $534 million in funding accounted for 9.1% of the 1Q total. The LA-Orange County region, which includes all of Southern California, 
except the San Diego metropolitan area, the Central Coast, and the San Joaquin Valley, came in fifth place with 55 projects sharing $365 million in funding. Sixth place went to the Southeast region with 33 projects spread across the states of Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Tennessee, South Carolina, and North Carolina. The DC slash Metroplex, defined as Washington DC, Virginia, West Virginia, and Maryland saw 30 projects sharing about 5% of the total funding and was followed in 8th place by the San Diego region with 3% over 26 projects. The remaining 12% of funding was spread over 228 projects in the following 9 regions. 1. Northwest, defined as Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. 2. Philadelphia Metro, defined as Eastern Pennsylvania, Southern New Jersey, and Delaware. 3. Midwest, defined as Illinois, Missouri, Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, Michigan, and Western Pennsylvania. 4. Southwest, defined as Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Nevada. 5. Colorado. 6. North Central, defined as Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska. 7. Upstate New York, defined as Northern New York State outside of the metropolitan New York City area. 8. South Central, defined as Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana. 9. Sacramento slash Northern California slash Northeastern California. There were no funding reports from the final geographic classification region, which is the combination of the outlying regions of Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. Industry classifications. Just as in geography, industry classifications matter, too. The VC wants to easily access the deal flow and intellectual capital pools of talent available that address his own sector expertise, be it a university, innovation center, research hub, or corporate R&D. Being close and having easy access to this sector expertise is a great value add to a VC. Venture capital investing has grown to cover much more than software and semiconductors. Users of the Money Tree Report can monitor funding across 17 different industry classifications. The first of these is biotechnology. This industry includes firms that are developing technologies related to drug and pharmaceutical development, disease treatment, and a deeper understanding of living organisms. This industry includes human, animal, and industrial biotechnology products, services, and related hard goods like biosensors and biotechnology equipment. Business products and services firms offer a product or service targeted at another business such as advertising, consulting, and engineering services. This category can also include distributors, importers, and wholesalers. The computers and peripherals industry includes manufacturers and distributors of PCs, mainframes, servers, PDAs, printers, storage devices, monitors, and memory cards. It also includes innovators in digital imaging and graphic services and equipment such as scanning hardware, graphics video cards, and plotters. Integrated turnkey systems and solutions are also included in this category. Consumer products and services industry members offer products or services targeted at consumers such as restaurants, dry cleaners, automotive service centers, clothing, toiletries, and housewares. Electronics or instrumentation is a broad classification that covers business and consumer electronic devices such as photocopiers, calculators, and alarm systems. It also includes electronic parts and equipment specialized instrumentation, scientific instruments, lasers, power supplies, electronic testing products, and display panels.
Financial services is an industry classification for providers of financial services to other businesses or individuals, including banking, real estate, brokerage services, and financial planning. Healthcare services covers both inpatient and outpatient facilities as well as health insurers. Hospitals, clinics, nursing facilities, managed care organizations, physician practice management companies, child care, and emergency care are examples of fundable projects in this industry. Industrial-slash-energy is the category that contains producers and suppliers of energy, chemicals, related materials, industrial automation companies, and oil and gas exploration companies. Also included are environmental, agricultural, transportation, manufacturing, construction, and utility-related products and services. IT services include providers of computer and internet-related services to businesses and consumers, including computer repair, software consulting, computer training, machine leasing-slash-rental, disaster recovery, web design, data input and processing, internet security, e-commerce services, web hosting, and systems engineering. Media and entertainment funding goes to creators of products or providers of services designed to inform or entertain consumers including movies, music, consumer electronics, sports facilities and events, and recreational products or services. Online providers of consumer content are also included in this category. Those who manufacture or market medical instruments and devices including medical diagnostic equipment, medical therapeutic devices, and other health-related products come under the classification of medical devices and equipment. Providers of data communication and fiber optics products and services fall into the networking and equipment classification. This includes providers of wands, LANs, switches, hubs, routers, couplers, and network management products, components, and systems. Retailing-slash-distribution funding covers firms making consumer goods and services available for consumer purchase including discount stores, super centers, drug stores, clothing and accessories retailers, computer stores, and bookstores. Also included in this group are e-commerce companies who sell their products or services via the Internet. There are, of course, still funding requirements for new and exciting developments in the original venture capital classification of semiconductors. This industry classification typically includes those who design, develop, or manufacture semiconductor chips, microprocessors, or related components including diodes and transistors. It also includes companies that test or package integrated circuits. Software is a major funding category, which covers producers of software applications for business or consumer use. This includes either bundled or unbundled software created for systems, graphics, communications and networking, security, inventory, home use, educational, entertainment, specific industries, or recreational applications. Companies focused on the transmission of voice and data including long-distance providers, local exchange carriers, and wireless communication services and components are funded under the telecommunications classification. Also included are satellite and microwave communications services and equipment. The final classification criterion is Other. The category includes those unique or different products or services that are not appropriately or accurately described by the other classifications. Sector Definitions The Money Tree Report uses three sector classifications, which can cross traditional industry classifications. The first of these sectors is Clean Technology. This sector is for companies that focus on alternative energy, pollution reduction, pollution remediation, or recycling, battery technology, and power supplies and conservation. The second sector is specifically for Internet-specific ventures. This discrete classification is assigned to a company whose business model is fundamentally dependent on the Internet, 
regardless of the company's primary industry category. The final sector is life sciences. The life sciences sector focuses on all deals involving biotechnology and medical device companies. Cooking the soup. There are many other websites, like CB Insights, www.kbinsights.com, and Strategy I Clean Tech, www.strategyicleantech.com, who provide the serious venture capital investor with all of the data about the deals that have been made. There are even private services costing thousands of dollars that try and pick winners even before they formally pitch their ideas. The trick is finding the golden needle in the haystack. There doesn't appear to be a secret formula for picking winners ahead of the fact, but there are firms who seem to have built pretty good track records. There are also a few VCs who have established themselves as somewhat prescient. We will discuss the process for arriving at the decision about who to fund and why, but let's take a quick tour of who is doing what today. Outstanding Venture Capital Firms Always On describes itself as the leading business media brand connecting and informing the entrepreneurial community in the global Silicon Valley. The editors of Always On, in concert with New York-based 451 Research and the Investment Research Group of Morgan Stanley, compiled the data for the total number and dollar amounts of successful M&A and IPO exits that the top 300 VC firms completed between October 1, 2010, through September 30, 2012. From this data, they determined the top 10 VC firms of 2012 and announced the winners at the 2012 Silicon Valley Venture Summit, held December 10 through the 12, 2012, at the Ritz-Carlton Luxury Resort overlooking the Pacific at Half Moon Bay, a perennial favorite venue for VC fund annual meetings. The analysts at Always On were not privy to the valuations paid by investors at each respective round of financing, so their list is admittedly a best educated estimation, however, the 2012 list nears an astounding $350 billion in exit value, proving that the strength of the venture-backed entrepreneurial community remains undiminished. To put some context on that number and to illustrate the multiplier effect of venture capital in the economy, Microsoft paid a $33 billion dividend to its shareholders in December 2004. It was the largest payout of its time and made up 6% of the total increase in personal income in America for that year. The first place firm selected for this honor was Excel Partners, www.excel.com, who were chosen not solely on the estimated $53.938 billion in exit value, but also on the strength of the underlying portfolio. These included the mobile advertising platform Amobi, which was acquired by Singapore Telecommunications, Brightcove, a global provider of cloud content services, Facebook, the ubiquitous online social networking service of which Excel still holds 10% equity, the electronic commerce and couponing website, Groupon, Cosmix, the internet advertising platform, which was acquired by Walmart. Next G Networks, the consumer electronics developer, which was acquired by Crown Castle for a reported $1 billion, and Trulia, the online residential real estate platform. The Palo Alto firm was founded in 1983 by Arthur Patterson and Jim Swartz and currently manages nearly $12 billion in funds. Second place went to Venerable Greylock Partners. The 48-year-old Waltham transplant manages nearly $2 billion. Their 2011 to 2012 exits were worth an estimated $67.2 billion and included some familiar names such as Instagram, the online photo sharing application, which was acquired in April 2012 by Facebook for $1.01 billion. Greylock was also involved in the Facebook exit as well as the $9.31 billion IPO of professional networking site, LinkedIn. Also included were hardware firewall experts Palo Alto Networks, SaaS HR and Payroll Solution Workday, and online gaming platform Zynga. 
Andreessen Horowitz came in third with $60.3 billion in exit valuations. It is a $2.5 billion venture capital firm that was launched on July 6, 2009, by Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz. Its 2011 to 2012 exits of note were Instagram, Facebook, and Skype, the voice and video conferencing application that was acquired by Microsoft in May 2011 for $8.5 billion. All of the top 10 VC firms honored at this gala have offices in the Silicon Valley area, and many people believe that that is the only place where one will find the serious venture capitalists. That simply isn't true. There are many active and dynamic venture capital firms located around the country. Harvard Venture Partners, www.harvard.net, of Birmingham, Alabama, has over $200 million in committed capital and recently exited Agility Healthcare Solutions in a 2008 acquisition by GE. Highway 12 Ventures, www.highway12ventures.com, is in Boise, Idaho. The VC firm was co-founded in 2000 by Mark Solon after he left Atlantic Capital Group in Boston. Highway 12 focuses on startups based in the Rocky Mountain region. Solon and company recently celebrated the exit of travel blog platform Everlater, which was acquired by AOL for incorporation into MapQuest. In the Great Lakes region, Arboretum Ventures is a venture capital firm specializing in the healthcare sector. They invest throughout the United States, but place special emphasis on startups in the Midwest. Jan Garfinkel spent 20 years in senior management positions with bioengineering and medical device companies before she founded Arboretum in 2002. The firm is headquartered in and Arbor of Michigan, and currently manages approximately $235 million in capital. Sadly, while our firm did not make the list of top 10 VC funds in generating absolute dollar IPO slash M and realizations, I am proud to share that we have been a serial investor in the VC space since 1981 and deserve an honorable mention for longevity. Gherkin Capital Associates is located in Mill Valley, California, which is, figuratively speaking, light years away from Silicon Valley. We are a registered investment advisor, and our asset management business is dedicated to alternative investments, with a core focus on leading, yes, doing the heavy lifting, early stage slash inflection point investments for both private and microcap listed companies. Our alternative investment products include both dedicated funds and separately managed accounts, aka customized accounts. Since our formation in 1989, we have been fortunate to participate in and generate top quartile investment returns for our investors. Maybe we LL make the next always on top 10 list. If it was easy. Benno C. Schmidt, Jr., is the son of the co-founder of seminal venture capital firm J.H. Whitney & Company and an accomplished man in his own right. He is the former president of Yale University and the former dean of Columbia Law School. In 2012, while serving as interim president and CEO of the prestigious Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, he oversaw a general review of the state of the venture capital industry as a whole. This review was conducted by Kaufman Quantitative Director, Bill Weeks. The foundation oversees an endowment of $1.89 billion, of which $249 million is invested in various VC funds. These are brand name funds, however, because of confidentiality provisions signed at the time of investment, neither their names nor detailed information about the fund's performance or structure can be divulged. The report was targeted to an audience of institutional investors and their investment committees and trustees. It was conclusive that the traditional model of venture capital investing, which had been developed by the larger, well-known firms, was not performing up to expectations. The great problem was that too many limited partners, LPs, invest too much capital in underperforming VC funds on misaligned terms. 
methods and assumptions that worked in the three decades prior to the mid-1990s are no longer effective or necessarily applicable. This is borne out by a Wall Street Journal article that appeared in the Small Business News on September 19, 2012. The article, written by Deborah Gage, looked at research by Harvard Business School, S. Shikhar Ghosh. He found that if one were to change the definition of failure from the industry standard to an investor-relevant definition, the results would be dramatically and significantly altered. Industry associations like the National Venture Capital Association like to say that only about 30% to 40% of startups have a high potential of failure, meaning the company has to liquidate all assets, with investors losing all of their money. Ghosh asserts that if the definition of failure were changed to the startup failing to see the projected return on investment, whether that means achieving a specific revenue growth rate or hitting a milestone date to break even on cash flow, the failure rate would climb to more than 95% of startups on an annual basis. My intention with this chapter is to better educate and build the knowledge base that VC sector investors need in order to spot the next generation of successful VC funds and investment opportunities. Only by understanding the inner workings of the process and the motivations of the participants at every level can investors realize the returns on investment and the inner sense of positive contribution that can only come from venture capital investing. Chapter 3 The Value Proposition The Multiplier Effect of Venture Capital Sometimes you get lucky, and the returns you get are not just measured in dollars and cents. In 1983, I was one of the general partners at Protec, the Prudential Securities VC Fund Unit. We made a seed investment in Summit Technology Incorporated, based in Waltham, Massachusetts. Our $3 million bought roughly 60% of the company. Dr. Dave Muller was the founder and CEO. He had patented the Excimer laser technology while at Cornell University. Subsequently, Summit was the first enterprise to receive FDA approval to use an excimer laser for photo-refractive keratectomy and the first company to receive FDA approval to mass manufacture and distribute excimer lasers. VISCs and other companies followed suit starting in 1986. The technology initially had two applications, one for laser ablation angioplasty, which Massachusetts-based Boston Scientific was to market, and the other for ophthalmic surgery, what has come to be known today as LASIK eye surgery. In 2000, Summit Technology was sold to Alcon for $948 million. Muller went on to form other companies, including Avidro, recognized as a global leader in the development of advanced technologies for ophthalmic applications. It was impossible to calculate in the early 1980s that Summit would eventually be acquired at such an eye-popping valuation. It did so for the simple reason that Dave Muller saw a need and filled it. He developed the Forerunner technology for the multitude of LASIK treatments that would dramatically improve the living standards for millions of people burdened with myopia and astigmatisms and dependent on eyeglasses and contacts, including me. Water water everywhere. Yes. Money is the yardstick that we are measured by in the financial markets, however, whether intended or a serendipitous by-product, the enormous social benefits and improved standards of living are the lasting rewards which cannot be truly quantified. It is ubiquitously referred to in the industry as social impact, investing and these opportunities are everywhere. In 2007, my co-author, Wes Whitaker, joined a fledgling angel investor firm as a project developer. His job was to travel around the country and hold pitch sessions, at which entrepreneurs would come and present their ideas in hopes of obtaining seed capital. Although he had to suffer through some fairly unrealistic and poorly executed PowerPoint presentations, the majority of the ideas were very good. Some of them were extraordinary examples of an outside-the-box approach to challenges facing the global community. 
one company had developed a method for causing cancer cells to virtually commit suicide. Another researcher had used a modification of analog signal processing to develop a method for warning of impending cardiac incidents. A group made a presentation featuring a variety of wind power generators ranging from backpack size all the way up to an integral part of a high-rise apartment building. Another inventor had an idea for harnessing the wave action of the ocean to produce electrical power. An architect from Sedona was seeking funding for a fully sustainable residential community that utilized solar power, graywater systems, and asynchronous fiber optic network, which allowed the house to monitor itself and was interactive with the community. Another developer was seeking funding for an eco-resort in Costa Rica, which would provide comfortable lodging for tourists while having a minimal footprint on the rainforest in which it was to be built. Then there were the water projects. Chlorine dioxide has long been known to be exponentially more effective for treating water and eliminating pathogens and mineral contaminants than the sodium hypochlorite, or simple chlorine, in common use today. The problem was that the generation of chlorine dioxide produced a very volatile gas that had a tendency to spontaneously explode. Consequently, Generation plants were very expensive to build and maintain. Most municipalities had opted for the cheaper chlorine, despite the undesirable aesthetic drawbacks of taste and odor. A California-based company had developed a method for producing an efficacious dry powder method form of chlorine dioxide that was not only safe, but economically competitive. Another form from Atlanta had developed a mobile water treatment plant which fit into a standard shipping container and could be modularized. Their goal was to provide potable drinking water to areas where the water supply was no longer safe, such as those affected by environmental disasters like drought or hurricanes. Wes had an epiphany. By merging the two companies, he saw an opportunity to develop a product that would have a lasting, Global Benefit, Mobile, Plug-and-Play Water Treatment Systems. It is these moments of synchronicity which not only drive, but also inspire most venture capital investors. It is great to make a lot of money, but as many have discovered, that is a short-lived and hollow accomplishment by itself. We are social beings at our core and we all have the need to bring value to our community in some way. Recent history has shown us that the race to accumulate earnings solely for the sake of building personal wealth ultimately leads to personal and professional dissatisfaction. There has to be more to our lives than the bottom line. Economy and Jobs Impact Venture capital is the DNA upon which our very successful capitalistic economy is based. To paraphrase a currently popular euphemism, VCs built this. Entrepreneurs and small to mid-size enterprises, frequently referred to as SMEs, represent the overwhelming majority of U.S. businesses and employers, accounting for as much as 93% of all businesses in the United States. These are companies with fewer than 50 employees for small companies and up to 250 for medium-sized companies. Congressman Eric Cantor, the House Majority Leader from the 7th District of Virginia, released a statement in November 2011 in support of Small Business Saturday, a national initiative to encourage people across the country to support their local, independently owned businesses. Small businesses are the driving force of the economy and create 70% of the jobs in America, said Cantor. In Europe, such firms play a similar size role in their nation's economies. Small businesses account for 60% of all jobs in France, 67% of the workforce in Spain, and 80% of Italy's workers. Because these SMEs do not issue bonds or sell equity in public markets they rely largely on banks for financing. And since SMEs are so vital, they are dependent on how cleanly interest rates are set by the central banks and feed through to the rates that firms pay. But the central banking system seems to have broken down globally. 
Data suggests the possibility of a depression in Spain and Italy severe enough to plunge the entire Eurozone into a much deeper crisis. Some solutions are being implemented. In the United Kingdom, the Bank of England offers banks $16 of funding assistance for every $1 of new loans to SMEs. An even bolder move would be for the central bank to buy SME loans directly from banks. The alternative of a Eurozone depression is far worse. As a template for other economies, both developed and emerging, VC is also growing in importance and has become a key catalyst in driving GDP growth, employment, personal income, and industrial production. Venture capital activity has a significant impact on all global economies. Venture capital is a catalyst for job creation, innovation, technology advancement, international competitiveness, and increased tax revenues. As a proxy for innovation within the economic sector, every year there are nearly 2 million businesses created in the United States. According to the 2011 Venture Impact Study, produced by IHS Global Insight, VC-backed companies accounted for 11.87 million jobs and over $3.1 trillion in revenue in the United States, based on 2010 data. Those totals are equivalent to 21% of GDP and 11% of private sector employment. More Economic Benefits Additional anecdotal evidence of venture capital S impact on the U.S. economy and financial markets includes the fact that the technology sector at large is now the majority component of the S&P 500's market capitalization. This is a significant increase from the mid-1980s when it was composed of less than 55 companies. As evidence of the eye-popping potential of venture capital, 80% of all initial public offerings, IPO, mergers and acquisitions, M&A, and venture capital investing dollar activity since J.H. Whitney & Company, J.H.W., was founded in 1946 and took place in the two-year tech boom leading up to the 2000 tech bust. There were 435 M&A transactions of VC-backed companies with an aggregate disclosed value of $21 billion in 2012, a 12.5% year-to-year decrease. 49 VC-backed companies went public in 2012, raising $21.4 billion, a 100% year-to-year increase. More S law is still very relevant and features prominently in recent news stories about the exponential increase in semiconductor memory capacity and technological innovation. Venture capital investment has been almost single-handedly responsible for delivering huge productivity gains to the U.S. economy by way of financing new information, communication technologies, and innovations. This contributed to a rapid advancement and acceptance in the emerging markets, where it has had a major impact on scaling manufacturing into their economies. Startup Business Benefits a November 2011 press release from the Kauffman Foundation revealed a survey showing that 54% of 18- to 34-year-olds in the United States want to start a business. When broken down by ethnicity or race, an even higher percentage of young people of color expressed a desire to start their own companies, 64% of Latinos and 63% of African Americans. Of those who said they were interested in becoming entrepreneurs, an impressive 18% actually tried to start a new business in the United States. This entrepreneurial endeavor was bested only by Australia, which had a 20% startup rate within the same demographic. Even in the Middle East, females beat the West as tech founders. Only 10% of tech entrepreneurs across the world are women where the average is 35% in the Middle East. Venture capital is one way in which you, as an entrepreneur, can build your company using other people's money OPM. The venture capitalist provides the capital to allow you to complete development or commercialization of your product, the expertise to help you prove the concept in the marketplace, and the management experience to guide you in growing your business into a profitable enterprise. 
In exchange, the venture capitalist takes a percentage of ownership or equity in your company. The ultimate goal of the venture capitalist is not altruism. It is that your company increases in value and ultimately has a liquidity event such as an initial public offering, IPO, to turn it into a public company that sells shares of stock, or a trade sale, a merger or acquisition, MNA, in which another company purchases or merges with your company. In either case, the VC is hoping to realize a substantial return on the capital and other resources invested. It is usually a pretty safe bet that the VC who is backing your startup is doing so because he or she has already been where you are going. They have already determined the probability of success and have a pretty good idea where the pitfalls are and how to avoid them. It is the wise entrepreneur who learns to trust the wisdom the VC brings to the table. It is also a way in which public and private actors can construct an institution that systematically creates networks that allow new firms and industries to progress. This institution helps in identifying and combining pieces of companies, like finance, technical expertise, marketing experience, and an intimate knowledge of various business models. Once integrated, these enterprises succeed by becoming nodes in the search networks for designing and building products in their domain. Social Benefits of New Technology and Innovation Reflect on the following examples of new technologies and innovations and how they impact the way we interact daily with business, family, and friends. If the notion of any of these technological breakthroughs seems far-fetched, remember that the TV and heavier-than-air flying machines once did too. Whether these emerging companies someday grow to the size of a Fortune 500 corporation on their own or are acquired for their groundbreaking products, most all rely on the venture capital industry to get their start. Medical Innovations Many of the nation's most innovative medical breakthroughs have been brought to market by billions of dollars of venture capital investment in life sciences companies. The economic impact and medical contributions of these life sciences companies have been enormous. Venture capital investors seek and invest in the most promising therapies and technologies to combat costly and too often fatal chronic conditions such as heart disease, cancer, stroke, and diabetes. Venture investment allows small startup life sciences companies to develop these technologies and commercialize them so that millions of Americans can have access to the most advanced treatments available. The revolutionary medical breakthroughs produced by VC-backed companies such as Amgen, Genentech, Genzyme, Gilead Sciences, Kaifon, Intuitive Surgical, and Symed Life Systems, along with hundreds of smaller innovative life sciences companies, amount to highly tangible and valuable improvements to the U.S. economy and to people's lives. Today, small venture-backed companies often serve as the research and development R&D, pipeline for the larger life sciences corporations who seek to acquire the most promising innovations. The good news for today, S. Baby Boomers is that medical celebrity Dr. Mike Roizen, chief wellness officer for the esteemed Cleveland Medical Clinic, has postulated that by 2023, any one of 14 areas of aging research might see a breakthrough allowing us to live to 160 with the same quality of life we enjoy at 45. Thank you, VC. Finally, a lot is written about the pluses and minuses of the two 300-plus page Affordable Health Care Act, AHCA, commonly referred to as Obamacare. With healthcare-related expenses accounting for 17.9% of U.S. GDP, and no doubt some real change to come in how healthcare is delivered, I would postulate that the single biggest impact on lowering costs will be the coming medical breakthroughs in the next 10 years, financed in large part by VC investment. Casual Games Signia Venture Partners, SVP, is an early-stage fund that makes investments in mobile, gaming, online video, and education technology. In June 2013, 
they began raising a $100 million fund to support the public's habit of playing games. SVP was formed by Playdom Incorporated founder Rick Thompson. He sold Playdom to Disney for $763.2 million in 2010 and two years later formed SVP with fellow tech industry veterans Dan Fidden, Ed Kluss, and Sonny Dillon in 2012. They started with $20 million of their own money for the first fund. SVP is based in Menlo Park, California. Thompson is a prolific tech investor who has found a way to leverage doing what he loves into a successful career. Thompson enjoys playing poker and chess, but he has been an investor and entrepreneur since 1995 and took note of the viral growth of digital games with companies like Zynga. He follows a founder-investor business model and gets closely involved with the early-stage companies with whom he works. His hand-in-glove approach has led to exits valued in excess of $5 billion during his career. His protégés are considered the next generation of game companies and include startups like mobile gaming firm Funzio, which Gree bought in 2012 for $210 million. Zynga acquired another company funded by Thompson, spending $3.8 million for Wild Needle, a company that focused on games aimed primarily at women. Thompson invested in Wild Needle originally because he recognized that mobile gaming is becoming a larger opportunity and it was one of the game startups that had a mobile-first strategy. Other startups in that genre, which he is mentoring, include Idle Games, Red Robot Labs, Grand Crew, Rumble Entertainment, Project Slice, Fun Plus, Airy Labs, Noise Toys, Vicky, Social Shield, Udemy, Triangulate, Ad China, and Addiction. Thompson is considered to be the game master in the VC world. In a recent interview with GamesBeat, the online subsidiary of VentureBeat dedicated to covering the gaming world, Thompson said he had invested in mobile gaming because no one was dominating the market. The challenge in a changing game market, said Thompson, is to get on the new horse and get up to speed as the other one starts to wear down. That certainly creates pressure on companies. The good news is that people are spending a lot more time gaming than they were previously. He also saw that the solutions to the challenges faced by game developers had applications across many other entrepreneurial startups. He said that he preferred to invest in multiple game companies because that gives him a much better feel for the state of the market, in contrast to investors who make maybe one investment in games. 3D Printing The economic impact of 3D printing is immense. By merely suggesting the potential promise to bring manufacturing jobs back to the United States, this technology is already having influence on U.S. trade accounts and underscoring the economic power of venture capital investing. In 1986, Chuck Hull founded 3D Systems in Valencia, California. While watching a flatbed plotter produce a large CAD-generated print of a schematic diagram, Hull had an epiphany and a solid imaging process known as 3D printing or stereolithography became a commercial reality. Along with that came the niche industry of rapid prototyping, the STL file format, and the registration of more than 60 patents covering every fundamental aspect of today's additive manufacturing technologies. Although initially ignored as a fringe technology, this startup is beginning to be recognized as significant as the 1976 startup of the little computer firm formed by the two Steves, Jobs and Wozniak, in the Jobs family garage on Chris Drive in Los Altos, California. Traditional manufacturing methods, machining in particular, use what has come to be called subtractive methods in which material is typically removed from the base stock by cutting, planning, filing, or grinding. Even though fabrication can be considered additive because of such processes as joining plates, sheets, forgings, and rolled work via riveting, screwing, 
or welding, it did not include the information technology component of model-based definition until the recent development of CAD-CAM, computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing, and digital process controllers. Additive manufacturing takes virtual blueprints from CAD or animation modeling software and creates digital cross-sections for the machine to successively use as a guideline for printing. Material is deposited on the build bed or platform until material slash binder layering is complete and the final 3D model has been printed. To perform a print, the machine reads the design and lays down successive layers of liquid, powder, paper, or sheet material to build the model from a series of the cross sections, which correspond to the virtual cross sections from the CAD model, fusing them together to create the final shape. The primary advantage of this technique is its ability to create almost any shape or geometric feature. Printer resolution, which determines the layer thickness and XY resolution in DPI, dots per inch, is typically around 100 micrometers, μm, with the individual particles measuring between 50 to 100 micrometers in diameter. Using additive manufacturing processes, Machines popularly known as 3D or three-dimensional printers can run unattended 24 hours per day, seven days per week. The printers require an occasional visit from a supervisor to top them up with the powdered materials they use as their kinks or to remove a completed item, but apart from that they can be left on their own. They build up the objects they are making one layer at a time, as the ink is sintered into place with a laser in a way that creates little waste and can make shapes impossible to achieve using the traditional, subtractive, technology of lathes, milling machines, and cutting tools. Western research and development companies developed the process, however, China is beginning to utilize the process in manufacturing parts from toys to aircraft structural members. One of the country's largest 3D printers is 12 meters long and produces titanium fuselage frames and high-strength steel landing gear, objects that require the metal they are made from to be free of flaws, which might cause them to fail. Although it is still a long way from replacing mass manufacturing, the technology is changing the way products are developed and made. A side benefit of this technology is that it is bringing formerly outsourced jobs back to U.S. manufacturers, underscoring the economic power of VC. Orbital in Orbit On May 25, 2012, a California firm called SpaceX made the first privately run supply mission to the International Space Station, ISS. It was a vindication of NASA, S decision to outsource such missions to the private sector and opened up a vast universe of possibilities for the forward-thinking VC investors in today, S space race. On April 21, at NASA S Wallops Flight Center in Virginia, another rocket built by another firm, Virginia-based Orbital Sciences, lifted off from the pad. Admittedly, the flight was only an initial test. The Antares went nowhere near the ISS itself. Nor was it carrying one of orbital S Cygnus space capsules, which, if all proceeds according to plan, will one day perform the actual docking with the ISS. But it is an important step, if everything continues to go well, then a Cygnus test flight may take place in a few months' time, and orbital S first ISS resupply mission could happen before the end of the year. The firm has a $1.9 billion contract with NASA to fly eight cargo missions to the station. That makes it pricier than SpaceX, which will fly 12 missions, two of which it has already completed, for $1.6 billion. But the competition ought to be a good thing for both companies. It certainly opens up a vast universe of possibilities for the forward-thinking venture capital investor. Social media. The global impact of social media has created a paradigm shift in how we communicate. Whether measured by the impact on U.S. presidential elections, the effect of the Occupy Wall Street movement, or its serving as the tool to spark the Arab Spring movement, 
the impact has been and will continue to be far-reaching. It was over in less than three minutes. At 1.08 p.m. on April 23, 2013, a fake tweet from a hacked Associated Press account asserted that explosions at the White House had injured Barack Obama. Stock prices immediately dropped, wiping more than $130 billion off the value of the S&P 500. That understates the severity of the episode, since in many cases liquidity simply disappeared altogether. It was the first Twitter crash and, as is often the case with Twitter, it was brief and superficial. The Associated Press itself was quick to clarify that the original report was false. This was echoed by the White House. Markets recovered, ending up for the day. The potential for social media to move markets has increased recently, after a report by the Securities and Exchange Commission enabled companies to use services such as Twitter and Facebook to report news. Bloomberg recently announced that it was integrating Twitter feeds into its terminals. Computerized trading algorithms that scan news stories for words like explosions may have proved less discerning and triggered the sell-off. That suggests a need for more sophisticated algorithms that look for multiple sources to confirm stories. The more we become interconnected through social media, the greater the possibility exists for us to become more and more alienated and isolated. It is estimated that more than 70% of the world's population utilizes the internet to access information and 20% of those use it to meet people. A growing phenomenon called catfishing, meaning to have a fake online profile, is causing a crisis in confidence in the information that is being presented. This creates a tremendous opportunity for investment in companies who come up with ways to quickly, efficiently, and economically validate information that is presented online as well as protecting data which needs to remain secure. Cyborgs The cyborgs are coming. These are powered exoskeletons, like the HULC, Human Universal Load Carrier, coming soon from Lockheed Martin. The HULC's initial intention is to help soldiers in combat carry a load of up to 200 pounds at a top speed of 10 miles per hour for extended periods of time. It's amazingly flexible. The system allows the user to run, walk, kneel, crawl, and even squat. It may be strictly military today, but the vast potential for enhancing human capabilities means that it won't be long before it has adapted to civilian tasks. Google Glass represents a giant step along the path that futurists like Kevin Warwick think is inevitable. That future belongs to the cyborgs. Warwick believes that once our brains are enhanced with powerful implanted electronic processors and we are neurally linked to the global net, our descendants will enjoy upgraded memories, sensory expansion, enhanced communication capabilities, and much more, all without losing their human qualities. Somewhere Ray Kurzweil must be grinning from ear to ear. While we are not yet advanced enough to start implanting tiny quantum chips in our brains, we are entering a precursor era, that of the wearable computer. Future of the car What was once one of the largest and most important industries contributing to the U.S. GDP, the automotive industry now accounts for only 4-5%, 6% if one includes auto parts. That is about to change dramatically as technological breakthroughs and VC investment help an industry transform itself into a 21st century competitor. Today the car seems poised for another burst of evolution. Granted, battery-powered cars have disappointed, but car companies are investing heavily in other clean technologies. Future motorists will have a widening choice of super-efficient petrol and diesel cars, hybrids, which switch between batteries and an internal combustion engine, and models that run on natural gas or hydrogen. Meanwhile, a variety of driver assistance technologies are appearing on new cars, which will not only take a lot of the stress out of driving in traffic but also prevent many accidents. 
More and more new cars can reverse park, read traffic signs, maintain a safe distance in steady traffic, and brake automatically to avoid crashes. Some carmakers are promising technology that detects pedestrians and cyclists, again overruling the driver and stopping the vehicle before it hits them. As sensors and assisted driving software demonstrate their ability to reduce accidents, regulators will move to make them compulsory for all new cars. Insurers are already pressing motorists to accept black boxes that measure how carefully they drive. These will provide a mass of data that is likely to show that putting the car on autopilot is often safer than driving it. Computers never drive drunk nor get distracted by texting, noisy children in the back seat, or a spilled cup of coffee in the lap. To those naysayers to whom all of this seems only remotely possible if not impossible, I share this personal anecdote. While with Prudek VC in 1985, I led a seed investment of a little over $2 million into a Menlo Park-based company called Navigation Technology Incorporated, the forerunner to today, SGPS. The firm was eventually sold to Philips in the early 1990s and went public as Navtech. In late 2007, Nokia announced that it would acquire Navtech in a deal valued at an estimate $8.1 billion. Seeds planted and properly tended do grow. The cashless society T he rapid growth of substitutes for cash, particularly debit and credit cards, has led economists to predict the advent of the cashless society. With domestic cash holdings amounting to roughly $2,250 per capita, we are still far from a cashless society. If you Google cashless society, you get about 600,000 references in under a second, and 20 pages into the references there are still articles on a future world where physical cash is no longer needed. Some see it as a sign of the then times, some as a capitalist plot, some as a frightening vision of socialists and ever bigger governments, and some as a logical step in the evolution of a technologically driven international commerce. Some of the cashless society references are showcase articles for the latest innovation that turns your phone or smart card into a functional wallet. The Bitcoin phenomenon, 28 million sources on Google, is a libertarian enthusiast, s dream of not just a cashless society but a society with no need for fiat money and central banks. Robodiptera Miniature flying robots have been developed that are no bigger than a fly and can now observe and record a situation virtually unseen. The successful flight of these miniature surveillance platforms was recently reported in Science magazine. The size of the crane flies wingtip to wingtip measure 3 cm and weigh 80 mg. Beyond military use, civilian applications include search and rescue or pollinating crops. Pratheev Sridharan co-developed a radically new manufacturing technique with J. Peter Whitney. Both are doctoral candidates, as of this writing, at the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, C's. Along with their colleagues in the Harvard Microrobotics Laboratory at C's, they have been working for years to build bio-inspired, B-sized robots that can fly and behave autonomously as a colony. Appropriate materials, hardware, control systems, and fabrication techniques did not exist prior to the RoboBees project, so each must be invented, developed, and integrated by a diverse team of researchers. The end result is a flying machine about the size of a penny. In 2009, the National Science Foundation established a funding grant for the program that would provide $2 million per year for five years. Financial benefit ties to investors. From the VC investor's perspective, the primary consideration in making VC investments is to gain additional incremental investment returns to their portfolio, commensurate with the additional risk exposure. Historically, the targeted investment return objective has been a 20 to 30 percent compounded return, resulting in an additional 500 plus basis points of incremental return to an investor's portfolio. 
According to Cambridge Associates, VC net annual returns have outstripped the S&P 500 by 8.6 percentage points from 1980 through 2012. Excel Partners' $12.7 million Facebook investment in 2005 created a $2 billion windfall when the stock was sold by Excel in the IPO. The joint Kleiner, Perkins, Coffee ELD, and Byers and Sequoia $20 million investment in Google became a $3 billion return each four years later. These mind-boggling VC investment returns are certainly not events that occur often, but happen often enough to continue to lure VC investors to invest in the space. The power of VC's multiplier effect so now you have an appreciation for the multiplier impact of VC. Not only VC investors benefit from venture capital versus financial rewards. There are also very meaningful economic and social benefits from VC investing for the recipient companies in terms of the employees working for the VC-funded companies, as well as their respective communities and institutions and infrastructure where the VC companies are located. Another byproduct of the multiplier effect is how the financial successes of entrepreneurs are again repeated by their desire to return to center stage with yet a new startup. There are many instances of 2-, 3-, and 4-time repeat entrepreneurs becoming angel and venture capital investors. These success stories are some of the most valuable contributors to the VC ecosystem and the U.S. economy. Sowing the Seed Imagine, if you will, a time a few years in the future. A group of young and very talented researchers from disparate fields have been brought together through social media and their shared interest in Star Trek. They are standing together on the balcony overlooking the floor of the New York Stock Exchange preparing to ring the closing bell, after which they will take limousines uptown to a private reception celebrating the multi-billion dollar IPO of their company, Recomtech. The Phi RM's new medical scanner, the Recombinator 2020, is a sophisticated integration of infrared cold laser nanosintering, holographic imaging, genetic engineering, and precision robotic guidance systems, which can repair damaged tissue, restore worn or damaged cartilage, and remove previously inoperable malignancies all while correcting defects in the patient's DNA code. Their new enterprise was made possible by a foresight venture capitalist who has just finished reading this chapter. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoy listening to this chapters as much I enjoy recording it. I understand that the video may have been too long for some viewers and if you're one of them I appreciate you sticking around for as long as you did. I will be posting the remaining rest of the chapters in another video, so be sure to keep an eye out for that. In the meantime if you want access to the remaining chapters. All you have to do is comment below on the comment section. Let me know if you're interested and I'll make sure drop remaining chapters for you. Also if you enjoyed this video please don't forget to like, share and subscribe to my channel for this kind of amazing audiobooks. Your support helps me continue to create high quality content for you to enjoy. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in the next video.